Hello, I'm Rocco Steno and welcome to Kit Lit TV. Today we have Chris Shirley with us and Chris is a debut author. Welcome Chris. Rocco, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And I should say that Chris is also the president of the Lambda Literary Foundation, now called Lambda Literary. Chris and I met a few weeks ago at a literary landmark a dedication for Walt Whitman because Landa Literary was one of the sponsors. Thanks for doing that. We were thrilled to do it. We count Walt Whitman as one of our own and it was wonderful to be there at the birthplace of America Shakespeare to, to be a part of that ceremony. So tell us a little more about uh, Landa Literary. Right. So Landa Literary is a 26-year-old uh, foundation or organization. We were founded to promote LGBTQ literature and so in fact that's our mission is to um, promote, celebrate, and preserve LGBT literature. And one of the activities is uh, awards. Right, so uh, we have the Lambda Literary Awards, which happen every year, usually the first week in June. And we give out 24 different awards in various categories in, uh, in, in, in the LGBT space. And one of the categories is a children and YA books. And I think you may be eligible with Playing by the Book, your new book. Yes, well, uh, I'm technically eligible. We'll see if Magnus Books thinks it's good enough to submit. Tell us about the book, Chris. It's about a boy preacher from Alabama who comes to New York and gets into all kinds of trouble. He's struggling with his sexuality. He's been told his whole life that being gay is wrong. And so he's, he comes and he actually falls in love with, a, with another gay guy and he has to deal with that. I wrote this book for both the LGBT audience as well as the fundamentalist Christian audience, which sounds kind of you know, like a difficult task. And I think that's one reason it took eight years for me to, to write the book and get it where it was publishable. Right, and um, how do you plan to go about getting fundamental Christians to read this book? Yeah, so it is kind of tough, and I had one editor once who said to me, Chris, your, your book is too gay for the Christian crowd and too, too Christian for the gay crowd. How do you bridge that gap? It was, it was very difficult. So what I set out to do, I said, I really believe that we all somehow do want to meet in the middle. So I set out to write this book where red state meets blue state, uh, gay meets straight, and where all faiths could, could coexist peacefully together. I feel like the, the Christian community, uh, is, which I'm a part of, is, um, it has found out about the book some, and I hopefully um, that, they'll, and that they will read it and embrace it and love it. The book could be considered somewhat religious. The Bible is quoted quite extensively through the book, and there's interpretations of some of the passages. Jake, you know, the protagonist, starts off being very, very tied to the Bible, and so because of that, he's always thinking about these verses that make his feelings not right. And so, but as he comes to, uh, to accept himself more, we see fewer Bible verses quoted. So, what was your inspiration for the book? Well, I was actually in church uh, listening to this fundamentalist preacher who I just respect so much, and he was going on about the love of Christ, and, and he talked about all the different sins that, that Christ would forgive you for. And then he got to homosexuality, and then just suddenly turned and talked about how gays were going to hell, it's just out of nowhere. It was, and, uh, and so I thought, wow, what would it take for this guy to come around? I thought, maybe if he had a gay son, he would. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe the more interesting story is about the gay son and not necessarily about the preacher. Like how could he survive in that environment? But that was only half the story, because then I thought, you know, all my friends back home in New York would just completely dismiss this preacher as a quack or whatever. And I said he would just dismiss them as people who didn't know the, the truth. And I said there's got to be a way to meet in the middle. And that's why I was so determined, and that's why I spent eight years making sure that this book sort of tried to bridge the divide between the LGBT as well as the, the religious community. How much of the book is autobiographical? When I think of a book, I think that there's the internal journey of the character and then there's the plot. So the plot of the book, what happens to Jake in the story, is not autobiographical, but the internal journey, uh, the theme of the book, in fact, I would say is very much autobiographical, and that is that learning from uh, becoming someone who's always looking outside yourself for approval to trying to be someone who looks inside to get approval has been my, my journey in life, and that's something that I continue to struggle with till today, and that's absolutely Jake's journey. There were sensual scenes in this book. Did your editor give you any advice? Wow, is my mom watching this? I hope not. No, but, uh, <laughs> but no, let's see, I, I would say that um, if anything, my editor almost didn't, didn't touch the, um, the, the more intimate passages in the book. It's so much of it takes place off, off screen and it really was in the very, very final edit that I got one note that's, that uh, was, 
Chris, I really feel like you're cheating your audience here by, by not sharing what actually happened in the prior scene. So I, I added back half a sentence and hope that my mom maybe didn't read it or read it really quickly. And, to, and I, I think that it, that was a really good note. I have a question. It says S. Chris Shirley. Right. What's the S? The for? S is Stuart. Yes. And why don't you use it? We don't. My, my parents never called me Stuart. Uh, in fact, um, they always called me Chris. And my mom is, when she was growing up, she always wanted to have a son. And she wanted him to be called Stephen Craig. And so when she had a, uh, a child, it ended up being a boy. She's like, great, I have my Stephen Craig. And then the doctor said, there's another one in there. And so she had a second boy and she had to come up with some name that sort of went with Stephen Craig. And so she loved Stephen Craig so much that she didn't want to give me more letters in my name than his. So I'm not even Stuart Chris. I'm just, I mean, I'm not even Stuart Christopher. I'm just Stuart Chris. Tell us about growing up as an identical twin. Right, well, it's, it's, it's wonderful growing up as an identical twin. Uh, you're an immediate celebrity the moment you clear the birth canal. It, like, everyone knows who you are. You're, especially in small town Alabama, uh, my, my, I grew up in a town that had less than 10,000 people, fewer than 10,000 people in it. So it was wonderful. So, um, but the correlation between uh, identical twins is 75% on their sexual orientation. And so I was convinced that my brother must be gay too. And I kept dropping hints uh, as a teen about, about this, but my, my brother actually ended up being, I can't say a ladies man, but he was very popular with the girls. In fact, some girls would look at me and they look at my brother and they would, and they would say to my brother, wow, you know, you just want to take me parking. And they'd look at me and say, you, you know, you just want to take me to dinner. You just want to go <laughs> dancing with me. So they could picked up on something even before I picked up on what the difference was. So it must have been very difficult uh, growing up in a fundamentalist Christian community as a, a gay boy. Right. I mean, hearing from the pulpit that gays are going to hell, it was, it was really very difficult. So, um, so that's why it took me so long to, to, to come out. I, I, uh, I really struggled with this. I, I, I ended up, when well, my brother was becoming more and more social, I was becoming, I was still social, but I began to really cling to the church and started reading my Bible more and, and really kind of becoming even more of a fundamentalist Christian, thinking that this was just a test and that Jesus would eventually heal me, not unlike Jake in the story, mm -hmm. who feels like Jesus will eventually heal him. And so, do you attend church now? I do, but not very much. I love my church, St. Bartholomew and 50th and Park, but, uh, but I don't go nearly as much as I should. Not nearly as much as my mom. And my mom, when I, when I speak to her, even just yesterday when I spoke to her, she said, did you go to church? And so it's always hard to say no, and I didn't. And the church is featured in this book. Yes, St. Bart's, yes, yes. There yeah. was actually a whole chapter in it about St. Bart's, but my editor made me take it out. <laughs> well, you could save it for your next book. It is, yes, I could. I was checking out the acknowledgments. You have over 100 people acknowledged in this book. That's a great way to sell books. <laughs> that is not why I did it. <laughs> no, I, uh, it's during the whole eight years that I was um that, that I was uh, writing, I actually created a list called Novel Angels. Mm -hmm. And so every time someone helped me out, I would, I would write their name down. And that's what became the acknowledgments at the end of the book because um, there's so much that goes into writing a book. Like, you know, there's so many ethnicities and it's cultures and stuff that are, that are represented here. And just to be able to, to talk to uh, a friend who's Sikh, because Jake's roommate in the book right. is Sikh. You know, would would how would he think about this, or would he use this word, uh, and how would he would how would he address someone who was elder to him? All of these people, like for them, maybe it was 20 minutes of their time, but it, it's something that I never could have figured out on my own. Well, one of the uh, famous names that I uh, saw is Tommy Toon. So, yes. how did Tommy Toon help with this book? Tommy was great. He he um, he actually I I was fortunate enough to spend a summer where I saw him very often on 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 a beach. And he said, he kept telling these wonderful stories about Barbara Streisand or, or whomever. It was just these great stories. And I finally said to him, Tommy, your stories are just so great. And I'm just afraid my stories would bore people. And he said, Chris, all we can do is tell our stories and hope that people find them interesting. And it, that was kind of the moment that I really began to say, maybe I could write a book. Now that you're a published author, the reviews come in, some good, some bad. How do you handle that? Well, uh, the best advice I've, I've been given is to not comment on reviews, and I've never accepted that advice, but I know it's good <laughs> advice. But, uh, but actually, the, one of the first reviews I got was, um, was awful. It was really awful. It, it was, um, 
and it hurt me deeply and I, I saw the irony of it because I said here you wrote a book about you should only get approval from within yourself and you get, you know, it was a one star review on Goodreads and you become crestfallen and, uh, and so I did pick myself up and I realized that, um, that you know, that I, I, I feel like I wrote the best book that I could and that's all I could do. And then the good reviews start, started coming in. In the Kirkus Review, they said you were an author to watch. I think they called me an author worth watching. Uh, worth watching. I think. No, I'm yes. joking. I know they did. <laughs> no, I appreciate that quote so much. It's on my bookmark. It's really great. And Glisten had positive things to say about your book. Yes, Kevin Jennings, part of the book. Yes, yes. Yeah, Glisten's a wonderful organization, and um, and so and, and so is P Flag. And I I I knew Glisten when it was a very very young organization, and P Flag I volunteered for. These are all great organizations. And one of the uh, things on your website is a teacher's guide. Right. And I think it has something like uh, 30 discussion questions. Right. Do you have a particular favorite question? Well, I am drawn to, I think it's question 15. It could be 12 or 15. Jake actually is crushing on two people at the same time while, while he was in the summer program at Columbia. He's crushing on Sam, who sits to his uh, right, and Julie, who sits to his left. And Julie, uh, once, once Jake comes out to her, he, she says to him, you know, people will accept you again. It's like, like when people find out if they truly love you, they will come around. And Jake wonders if that's true. And so it opens a debate in class about that. And then I search my soul about that. And, and I, I, I have lost some friends when I came out to them, some devout Christians in that way. But the vast majority have been very accepting of me. And so, the, and so that is the, my favorite question for that reason, because it touches on the theme. So now that the book's out, I'm sure you're working on other projects. Well, I fleshed out a, a second novel, as, uh, and it's about uh, identical twins and one straight and one gay. It's a story that I feel like I'm not, uh, that I uniquely qualified to tell as well. So that's the next project that I'm working on. Well, good luck with that, and Thank thanks you. for being with us yes. uh, today. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Rocco. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm.